All right, we're going to move off of wokeness, and we're going to talk now about technology. Obviously, a, another massive subject that we could talk about in an entire elective unto itself, but we have the joy of sort of dipping into these things. About 40 years ago, the cultural commentator Neil Postman said this in his epic book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, a book all of you should read, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Americans no longer talk to each other. They entertain each other. They do not exchange ideas. They exchange images. This was about 35 years old as a quote. They do not argue with propositions. They argue with good looks, celebrities, and commercials. Is it not funny to hear those words read and think about how different we, our society is from 1985 and 2020? It's very important that we understand that this uh, point that Postman has made about entertainment and by extension that which allows for entertainment, technology, has absolutely shaped the church, affected the church. People do expect to be entertained now on a regular basis. When you come to a church, people think that you're going to entertain them in a spiritual way. They don't think that you're first and foremost going to give you ideas, going to give them ideas, that is. And they don't, in many cases, know how to argue with propositions, like Postman says. Now, of course, I'm guessing many of you are not going to be in this stream of church life by virtue of being at this seminary, even as many of my students at Midwestern in Kansas City are not in this stream. Nonetheless, again, I repeat myself, we're in an entertainment-driven culture. I don't know if you have caught yourself thinking this, but I have caught myself thinking this, that I, I have a, almost a need to be entertained on a daily basis. I, I need to be able to consume after a long day's work and, and then plugging in with my children and loving my wife, trying to, I need to be able to watch English Premier League soccer and rest. I saw, I saw a fist pump there from Reed. I like that. We're going to talk about that soon, who, who you cheer for. I want to hear about that. Uh, I need to be able to watch some basketball. I need to be entertained. Well, look, we all need mental breaks in some form, but do we need to be entertained? And is the church about entertainment? Is that why we exist? To entertain people with a little theological burst at the end. We need to think through these matters, and we need to think much more broadly about the subject of technology that makes an entertainment culture go in so many respects. In this session together, in this time, I want to consider how the Bible handles technology. Now, that is a really interesting question, isn't it? Because you're not going to find a lot of sections in Scripture explicitly on technology. You're not going to find that term throughout the Bible, and yet I'm going to submit to you that what we're going to see in the minutes that follow is that the Scripture actually has a good bit to say about the subject. But before we dive into that, I want to do what we have been doing, and I want to think culturally for just a little bit with you. I want to think about our technological age, and I want to think about how technology is speaking theologically in our time specifically. Then, when we have established that, we will go to Scripture. Off the bat, we need to say as believers that we don't have a quarrel with science. In fact, science at base is not a worldview, it's a method. The scientific method is the means by which claims in the natural world are tested. So we do very much affirm science as Christians, but we do not affirm scientism. Scientism is the view that science alone furnishes us with the truth we need to make sense of the world. That is not a perspective we as Christians can affirm. The believer is one who recognizes that all truth is God's truth, but also recognizes that in terms of technology and the ability to create and make things, we're dealing with the ability 
to, to make beauty and things that are good, but we're also dealing with the ability to warp the creation and dishonor God in a profound way. In the 21st century, this has real relevance because an emerging school of thought is what is called transhumanism and a related one, posthumanism. And so in an elective like this, we have the ability uh, to talk about these views at a little greater length. Michael Plato defines transhumanism in these terms. It's an ideology that promotes striving for immortality through technology. Let me re uh, repeat that. An ideology that promotes striving for immortality through technology. And continuing the thought, transhumanists seek to improve human intelligence, physical strength, and the senses by technological means. I gave reference to this on Monday, but this is essentially the view that humanity is not enough, that we should augment our humanity and become, really, a, a being that transcends the normal creaturely limits of the human person. That is what transhumanism is after. Transhumanism is a vision that reimagines humanity along technological lines to essentially upgrade the human person. Humanity, in this line of thought, needs improvement, needs technological upgrading, and there is not a theological vision that limits or shapes that technological upgrading. Instead, according to many transhumanists, we are free. We are completely free to remake the human body and remake the human person as we see fit. And then the second school of thought aligned with transhumanism and in many ways coming out of it is what is called posthumanism. Posthumanism is, according to Plato, the rejection of the humanist tradition that centers in human exceptionalism. So the Western tradition believes that the human person is the apex of creation, and there's much that flows from that view. But post-humanists argue that humanity is no different from any other life form, and so we should actively seek for the transcending of human existence. Transhumanism says basically upgrade human existence, augment it, improve it, Posthumanism says, eh, we're fine not simply to upgrade it, but even to leave it behind altogether. We actively can seek and even should seek a posthuman future where consciousness still exists, but it may very well exist in the cloud. It may uh, exist in a kind of uh, robotic form. So non human subjects are just as human in this sense as the human person. Post-humanists then don't view humanity as the special creation of Almighty God. Post-humanists identify consciousness or mind in all things. So here's what one voice in the post-humanist community has said. Stars, hills, chairs, rocks, scraps of paper, flakes of skin, molecules, each of them possess the same inner glow as a human. Each of them has singular inner experiences and sensations. So everything that exists is basically at the same level as the human person, including, according to this voice, Rudy Rucker, stars, chairs, like the one I was just lifting up a little bit, scraps of paper, flakes of skin. The argument here is that everything has consciousness. So instead of grounding uh, the human person as image bearer, made in God's image, and thus as distinct from the creation, the posthumanist grounds uh, human existence in shared consciousness with all, all that exists, really. I was going to say every creature, but not just creatures. Uh, chairs are not creatures. This is a major anthropological claim, as I'm sure you're picking up. The idea that uh, we don't start with the uniqueness of humanity as a mago day and work from there. We start with this concept called consciousness or mind, and then we find it in all sorts of things. So 
the post-humanist views the eventual outmoding of humanity not simply as a possible outcome, but as an ideal outcome. Post-humanism, therefore, can be said to be anti-human and nihilistic at its core. This is not a philosophy that accords with uh, Christian theology. Now, here as in other areas of the course, we should identify soft and hard forms of both transhumanism and posthumanism. We should note that there are transhumanist and posthumanist visions, for example, in different movies we watch, different entertainment media. You think of uh, Avatar, for example, as a movie. That's a movie that has a kind of post-human vision at its core, that this man is in a human body and that he can then transcend his existence by taking on, through sort of merging of consciousness, another uh, being's life form. Well, that would be a, an example of soft transhumanism unto posthumanism as one example. But then there are other voices out there that make the claim that uh, humanity is not the steward of creation and was not put here by God to take dominion of the earth. Actually, humanity is the scourge of the earth, and so we should actively pursue the changing of the human person in order to save the planet. Uh, let me take you, for example, to an article by uh, several uh, thinkers in the secular journal Ethics, Policy, and the Environment. I interact with this a little bit in Reenchanting Humanity as well. And this content syncs, that I'm giving you syncs with Reenchanting Humanity. It's developed from it. Authors who wrote uh, this article, Liao, Sandberg, and Roche, argue that transhumanism is a positive reality, humanity and human existence is really a problem to be solved, and Earth is the property that needs to be saved. So this is what is so interesting about many transhumanist and post-humanist advocates. They don't believe that humanity should be esteemed and saved. They believe that the Earth should be esteemed and saved. And really, this is what happens in a lot of environmental visions of the human person as well, uh, which is also, in a different sense, a conversation about technology and human existence, of course. There is the prioritization, prioritization excuse me, of the earth over humanity. When, though the Bible calls us to steward the earth, humanity is prioritized over the earth. But many environmentalists today, and these authors that I'm about to quote are in this stream, will argue that we need to change humanity in order to save the earth. Where Christians would argue that we need to change the earth in order to save humanity. <laughs> so there's a, a kind of reversal of biblical priorities that you will find in many technological visions. The earth needs to be saved. The earth is warming. And so what we, knew, we need to do is we need to reduce humanity's footprint on the earth. Well, that is basically what this article that I am citing, entitled Human Engineering and Climate Change, calls for. Human Engineering and Climate Change directly links uh, tweaking the human person in a transhumanist way with saving the earth. We can warp and re-engineer humanity because we need to save the planet. Again, that's a reversal of the biblical priority. It's not that the earth is unimportant to us, but it is the case that the earth was made for humanity. We were not made for the earth. The earth is do we don't exist in order that the earth would exist. The earth exists in order that we would exist. Make sure you understand that. Make sure you preach and teach that to people who may be pulled by these ideas. The earth is created for humanity, the vice regent of the earth. In this article, Human Engineering and Climate Change, we hear this. Scientists should alter the human immune system to induce mild intolerance to meat. So scientists should re-engineer genetically human people so that we have an inborn intolerance to meat in order actually to shrink 
Humanity. I'm not making this up. This is an article in a serious scientific and ethical journal. Again, Ethics, Policy, and Environment. The argument continues. Human ecological footprints are partly correlated with our size. Reducing the average American height by 15 centimeters would mean a mass reduction, a bodily reduction, of 23% for men and 25% for women, with a corresponding reduction of metabolic rate, 15% for men, 18% for women, since less tissue means lower nutrients and energy needs. You might say, but why are these authors calling for this reduction in diet unto a reduction in actual bodily size? It is so that we will actually have less footprint on the earth. What, what are you hearing? Why am I citing this rather strange argument? Because you must understand this is a transhumanist argument, whether it intends to be one or not. In other words, we should fundamentally alter the nature and constitution of the human person in order to oppose climate change and to save the earth. In addition, this journal article, Human Engineering and Climate Change, argues that we should change the human person cognitively. There seems to be a link between cognition itself and lower birth rates, the authors say. So they argue that we should pursue pharmacological enhancements in order to make humanity more altruistic and empathetic. Well, what is that language code for? That means targeting testosterone. <laughs> and this is really interesting because according to the authors of this journal article, testosterone appears to decrease aspects of empathy. Testosterone appears to decrease aspects of empathy. Okay, I'm citing this journal article you've never heard of in a conversation about a rather strange philosophy called transhumanism, which may sound rather esoteric. But what is playing out in this? What is this vision? I want you to understand again that this is an anti-human technological vision. The technology that humans have developed the scientific advancements that have been made, our greater understanding of diet and how the human constitution works, should all be applied, these authors argue, in, in order to re-engineer humanity, in order to make the human person less of a burden on the earth, in order to lower birth rates, in order to increase empathy, in order to downplay and uh, target testosterone because testosterone, which of course is going to be associated with manhood, is associated with decreased empathy. That may actually be true. I think men probably do have decreased apathy in comparison to women, but the question you should be asking as you're hearing me cite this rather strange article is this. Is it a good thing that we would effectively drain the earth of meaningful manhood? Is that a biblical vision? This is a transhumanist vision. This is a vision that seeks to change the human person in order to change and really preserve the earth. Technology in this instance, in this article, should be employed in order to re-engineer creation, should be employed to change the human person as designed and made by God. And I want you to note very quickly uh, what I just cited, that argument against manhood. Manhood in different forms is seen as toxic today. You heard me voice that a few class sessions ago, but I want you to note that article. Men being less empathetic, men being less feelings-driven, is seen as a negative reality by our society. We really, in many ways, have transitioned from a masculine society to a feminine society. We've transitioned from a masculine society to a feminine society. Now, in noting that, which I believe is true, we're not saying things used to be perfect and amazing, and now they're all ruined. A masculine society has many failings and shortcomings. 
just as a feminine society does. But what you need to ask is this more broadly. Does the Bible want there to be a strong culture of manhood in general in the world, certainly in the church, and certainly in the home? And that is absolutely the case in the Christian worldview, isn't it? We talked about this at some length, that God wants men to be strong, and being part of a being, being a strong man, part of that is leading, and leading with conviction, and not stepping back, leaning back, uh, but actually taking ownership and responsibility and making decisions and exercising authority and taking dominion. So th- this is at base, really, when you, when you scratch it all the way through, uh, a man-hating philosophy. And that's what you should expect of worldly thinking at some level. Uh, what, what is Satan going to want to do if God has set men up to take leadership? Well, he's going to want to re-engineer a society so that men don't take leadership because that's contrary to God's plan, to God's will, to God's design. And that is fascinating to discover embedded in a technical journal article that almost nobody noted. Why cite it? Because this is not simply an esoteric academic piece of work. This is actually telling you a lot of where elite thinking in the West is. We need to save the planet. We need to reduce our footprint. It is certainly a positive thing that we would have less children. If we need to use abortion, we can use abortion. What is abortion? As I'll talk about in a few minutes ago, abortion is the the application of technology to the process of childbearing, child formation. And then finally, we should actively uh, medicate men so that they have less testosterone. That is a positive thing. Actually, I read an article uh, just this week that said that the average 25-year-old man has the testosterone level some decades ago of 66-year-old men. And older men, as many of you will know, uh, decrease in testosterone sharply as the years go by. Uh, Different articles that I've seen have showed that men have significantly less grip strength. (laughs) It's been measured. Uh, than, than was true in the past. So I want you to know that we really are seeing the trends play out that these authors call for. Men really are actually, in physical terms, weaker. They have less testosterone, and they are socially hearing that they need to step back uh, in many senses, and indeed they are. Well, all of this is theology. This isn't just ethical journal writing. This is, these are theological claims that are being made. Transhumanists don't simply want humanity to get a little bit of a boost. Transhumanists hold to a secular anthropology, doctrine of man. They believe in a secular homartiology. Essentially, uh, they need to save the planet. We're ruining the planet. They quest after a secular soteriology I just mentioned, and they live in thrall to a deeply paranoid secular eschatology uh, that, that if we don't save the planet, everything is ruined. A good number of people out here in California, but really all throughout the West, have that as their major cause to save the planet, to stop climate change. In noting that, I'm not saying we never would pay attention in different dimensions to climate change and stewardship of the earth and these sorts of things. We, we surely do because of Christian theological convictions derived from the Bible. But it is to say that this is an altogether different worldview than the Christian worldview. It's part of why we need to train our people to know about technology and biblical and theological terms. Because other people who are engaging in technology and developing it in different forms don't have the same worldview. They're not operating from the same standpoint. They do not have the same convictions. Transhumanists, for example, have a fundamental evolutionary commitment, don't they? They believe that mankind not only can evolve, but actively should pursue evolution. So that's not an incidental part of our existence. That's a necessary part of our existence that we evolve, that we change, that we genetically re-engineer ourself. Transhumanists believe, then, that our 
fundamental problem of human existence is not a spiritual one, it's a physical one. You think of Silicon Valley and the quest of the Google co-founders, for example, to overcome death. Uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, as some of you have heard, are investing millions upon millions of dollars to solving, trying to solve the problem of human mortality. What you're seeing in such a quest is a, again, secular vision of humanity in which salvation is not spiritual, it is physical. Salvation doesn't come by divine grace. Salvation comes by genetic re-engineering. And so humanity and scientists should have a free hand to rewire the human body, to shrink the human appetite, to stop procreating, to reduce testosterone. By the way, quick word there, procreation, having children, having babies is altogether seen in negative terms in a transhumanist, secular technological vision of the world. Having babies is filling the earth, is populating the earth, is depriving the earth of resources, and that is a negative, that is a negative development in our time. That's yet another way, along with those I've already mentioned, that we see that, again, this is theology. But it's not sound theology, it's anti-theology. It's saying that what God pronounces as good is actually bad. And this, this ideology is having a major effect in America and in our society. Uh, a few years ago, Newsweek uh, ran a cover story on the childless couple. The childless couple. This is becoming increasingly common in our society and even in the church. Couples that simply decide we're not going to procreate. We're not talking a bit, uh, we're not talking here, excuse me, about couples that struggle to procreate. That is something that different families, different couples face, and it can be a major challenge and, and a real spiritual trial that calls for care and love and help from the local church. So let that be said. We're not talking about an unwanted childlessness. Uh, we're talking about a desired childlessness. A transhumanist vision goes hand in glove in many cases with a kind of perspective that sees having children as, for various reasons, a negative reality. It's not good, for example, to have a big family. And if you pay attention to different cues in our society, you'll hear lots of people sneer at big families, at uh, fathers and mothers, note I didn't say parents, who choose to have a number of children. There's a lot to think through in terms of your own family, but I want to encourage you to be a rebel in that sense. As much as God would allow you, as much as your family can handle, your wife can handle, of course, I've, I've called you men to be providers for your family. I believe your wife has that God-given vocation of child raising and nurturing those children uh, as they grow. I think that's a, a biblical call. She honors and obeys scripture. When she, when she follows that biblical call, just as you honor God, when you follow the biblical call to provide, even though that is weight on your shoulders, even though that is hard, even though that may involve working multiple jobs, even though you may not get the sleep you desire, et cetera, and so on. Nonetheless, the biblical vision of family, suffice it to say, is targeted by a transhumanist and secular anthropological vision that is technology-driven. We need to make clear in our pulpits and our churches that it is a blessing when God gives children. It is not a hindrance to our happiness. Will, the, will there be all sorts of trials and challenges as we have children, as we have, God willing, numerous children? Yes, there will. We should expect to see our free time and our me time sharply diminish. We should expect that there will be all sorts of complications. This is actually the way God wants it to be for most of us, Th that our lives would not be ordered around our creature comforts and our plan for the day and what we would like to do and how we would like to spend our me time. This is one of those ways where we see from an article like the one I cited a few minutes ago that the biblical family and God's vision for the family is countercultural. It's not the same thing as a, a worldly vision of the family, but it is a, it is a, a God-blessed family that has a full quiver 
whatever exact number that amounts to, as many as you're able to have through natural means and then through adoptional means. But that is all opposed by our modern, secular, and neo-pagan order. Transhumanism also promotes, as does secularism, as does neo-paganism, the goodness of abortion. Abortion is, in a biblical system, the most wicked thing you can do, I believe. What is a worse action than to kill a helpless baby? What is more evil? What is more anti-God? What is more anti-image of God than not just killing an adult person, a grown person, even a child, but killing a helpless baby? But this is what our society encourages us to see as good. We we are told that being pro-choice and a woman having an abortion is not simply allowable, but is effectively virtuous. And this is part of what I believe is that kind of religion and spirituality of neo-paganism. In true theology, having children is a blessing and a sign of of virtue, in a sense. In in a neo-pagan worldview, in a satanic worldview, killing children is essentially a virtue and a blessing. This is not a new reality. Abortion is actually not new, or, or at, le- at the very least, targeting children, precious children, is not new. You think in the ancient Near East of how the Canaanites used to sacrifice children to Molech, for example. From archaeological excavations, we know that statues of, statues of, of Molech would be heated up to a truly horrific degree, and then little babies would be placed by the Canaanites on the statue of Molech, probably, I don't know, 500, 600 degrees. Picture an oven. It's like placing a baby in an oven. And the the Canaanites would sacrifice their children, what? As an act of worship. As an act of worship to their God. I ask you, is there a satanic system coursing throughout the Bible through different cultures, different societies? Is there a plan of God and a design of God? And is there an anti-plan to kill, to destroy the image bearer? And an anti-design to erase the fact that children, especially babies in the womb, need protection and care and love? I believe there absolutely is. I believe that abortion is not simply... Uh, a, a bad practice of our society, but is a satanic attack upon image bearers who are made for the glory of God. Technology, please understand, then, is employed to destroy and deface the image of God. Abortion has only been developed further from the days of the Canaanites And just as we can use technology for good ends, as on a Zoom session, as on a recording, as in YouTube videos, on and on it goes, so we are very much able as human people to use technology for the most evil ends there are, including the needless slaughter of the unborn. What we're pulling together here, men, is we're pulling together, I think, Uh, an appropriately textured picture and conception, no pun intended, of technology. We need to think through technology with great care, and I don't think the Bible enfranchises either a full denial of Christians using technology, employing it, or a full embrace. Instead, I think the Bible calls us to a far more measured and thoughtful position. We need to recognize Uh, along these lines that we can use technology for the best of means and ends, but we also can use technology for the worst possible pursuits. We think as well, not simply of abortion today, in terms of how we use technology 
to blaspheme God and harm human beings, but pornography. Modern pornography is the result of a veritable industry of technology. Pornography today is available in myriad forms on innumerable platforms. In about five seconds, if you want to find it, you can find it. In about five seconds, you can find images and videos of things that humanity has long wanted to contemplate but never could have accessed immediately at its fingertips. But now, thanks to growing digital technologies, computer-based technologies, of course, Pornography is basically available at any point in time that we could desire it. Any of us who have a smartphone, any of us who carry one in our pocket, are carrying at all times an on-ramp to some of the most detestable and abominable sin there is imaginable. If you're going to have a smartphone, if you're going to use a tablet, a computer, You have your own set of matters to handle. You have decisions before you. I'm not going to say to you what is the one policy everybody should adopt, but I will say that at the very least, here is where we're really starting to bump up against discipleship, aren't we? At the very least, you need to have a theology of your smartphone, a theology of your devices more broadly, don't you? You, you need to be playing defense and offense to go back to my don't be taken captive and take every thought captive. Well, if we switch that a little bit out of uh, the intellect, ideology versus the truth, and if we apply it, that principle in a similar fashion, I think we can. We, we can find biblical text to ground this surely, but if we just use that framework for a minute, we need to play defense and offense against lust, don't we? Every one of us? Not some of us, every one of us, especially men who on average have a much stronger drive, sex drive, and, and drive to consume these kind of, of, of problems than women. This is a problem for, for men and women alike today, let that be said, and pornography usage rates are rising among women today, studies are showing. Nonetheless, at the very least, every man who is in ministry or wants to be in ministry needs to be ready to play defense against lust and against pornography, or against evil images, and then also to play offense against it. You should have a plan for how you're going to use your smartphone. You should have a plan for how you're going to use your tablet and your computer. You and I I know alike that it is very easy not simply to have temptation arise that is unasked and unbidden, but actually to put ourselves in what we could call the neutral zone where maybe we're not Googling uh, pornographic movies or something like this, but we're kind of, we're like that uh, young man in Proverbs 6 and 7 who, who is not at home at night. He, he's not where he should be, in other words, is he? Now, he hasn't gone to a brothel in the context of that part of Proverbs. He, he hasn't entered a den of iniquity straightforwardly. But where is he? He's out in the streets. It's at night. His father says that he should be home. But he's not at home. What's he doing? He's wandering the streets. But what's he really doing? It's not just that temptation could pop up. That happens to all of us, unasked for, unbidden. It's that he's putting himself in a so-called, hear the air quotes, see them, neutral zone where he's not directly engaging wickedness, but he's, at the very least, putting himself in much closer proximity to it. If you have a tablet, a phone, a device like this, it it is not hard, let's put it this way, it is not hard for you to wander those streets at night, is it? You, You need... All of this flows from a proper theology of technology, I think, especially given the way our technological devices work today. All this means you need to play defense and offense 
against your sin. And I'll say one further word here. If you are enslaved to pornography, which happens among young men in particular today, you, you, need, to, you need to pull over to the side of the road. If you are addicted to lust, you need to pull over to the side of the road. You need to find a pastor at your church. You need to talk to a godly elder. And you should, I believe, step out for a season of pursuing the ministry. And you should then enact very serious controls on your life. Things like not having a smartphone, having a so-called dumb phone, apologies to those forms of phones. Not having a smartphone, not having a tablet or computer in your bedroom, those sorts of things, or wherever the temptation patterns arise. Not going to places that cause you to struggle. On and on it goes. But men, men, you and the men you lead sh should not content yourself with belonging to an accountability group and staying the way you are. You, you should pull off. You should not pursue ministry for a season if you are addicted to these things. And you should, you should opt out, I believe. You may return. I hope you do. But you should opt out, and you should not simply go to Starbucks and tell peers your age how often you're falling into patterns of lust and masturbation or whatever it may be. You should seek accountability from elders and pastors, and you should embrace stringent requirements upon yourself. You and I have been, many of us, educated in a very so-called grace-driven context, which in certain theological forms means that we just keep going back to our vomit over and over and over again. And there's no, there's no real cost. There's no change. There's no victory. And, and that is... Please understand me, like a dog going back to its vomit over and over again. And what you should do instead is you should recognize that grace drives holiness. And holiness means action driven by desires for God, not desires for sin. And so you should embrace whatever is necessary to overcome temptation. We're all going to face temptation. We all will fail. We all will sin. We all must repent, every one of us, on a regular basis. I'm not talking about that, though. I'm talking about addiction, which is rampant, even in the church, and which must be dealt with by something stronger than hanging out with your buddies and talking through how you've been tempted. You need something much stronger than that. You need drastic measures. You need a zero-tolerance policy against sin. We all do. We need a zero-tolerance policy. What does pornography do? Scientists have shown that pornography warps the brain. It actually warps the brain. You're not just looking at bad images and thinking bad things. Viewing pornography, William Struthers writes in an InterVarsity book, is not an emotionally or physiological, physiologically neutral experience. Excuse me. It is fundamentally different from looking at black and white photos of the Lincoln Memorial or taking in a color map of the provinces of Canada. Men, in particular, are reflexively drawn to the contents of pornographic material. As such, pornography has wide-reaching effects to energize a man toward intimacy. It is not a neutral stimulus, William Struthers writes. His book is entitled Wired for Intimacy. I encourage you to seek it out. Wired for Intimacy. It draws us in, Struthers writes. Porn is vicarious and voyeuristic at its core, but it is also something more. Porn is a whispered promise. It promises more sex, better sex, endless sex, sex on demand, more intense orgasms, experiences, Struthers argues, of transcendence. If you wanted to say it simply, you could say porn transcends the physical, doesn't it? And it, 
it verges into the spiritual. Sex does in general. It's not a mere physical act in a way, frankly, that is a little bit hard to pin down and define. Sex is spiritual. It's unitive. It, 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 brings us, it brings us into some kind of form of transcendent experience, at least briefly. It's a very strong human experience, sex is. And pornography is an approximation, a verisimilitude of that. It's not neutral, and it's not merely physical, Struthers argues, building off of studies of the brain that have been done on those who get addicted to pornography. Pornography, Struthers says, is a polydrug. That's a technical term. A polydrug. P-O-L-Y drug. It's effectively a cluster bomb on the brain of men. It, 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 it's a takeover of the brain. You're not just looking at a little image. It ramps up your emotions. It's hard to, ex it, 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 it's hard to trace why. <laughs> but it is this. We talked about how humanity is complex, didn't we? We talked about how we don't reduce to mere clumps of cells and atoms. We're not merely physicalist or materialist or naturalistic. Well, this is one of those weird in-between places that we see that this is true because just viewing an image really shouldn't do all of this, but it does. It has an explosive firebombing effect on the male brain and, and, and the male person in general. It ramps up the emotions, as I said, it awakens the senses, it energizes the body. This is all what scientists show pornography does. God is the one who wired the man to desire the woman. There is no shame in godly sex and sexuality. God has wired men to have explosive desire. We talked about this already in the class. But here is an example of how we see technology easily can warp us and change us and bring us out of the, the normal rhythms of the world God has made and into unnatural rhythms. Technology will drive us into unnatural territory very quickly if we are not careful. And that is a dangerous place to be. That is not a pleasure palace, as our society says it is. To be driven into the realm of the unnatural, the realm made by man, not made by God, is a very precarious place to be. As we have said already, Men and women alike who view pornography think that they are free, but in truth they are enslaved. This isn't a class on, you know, improving your marriage or something like this, but let it be said that sometimes, even in the church, we approach sex as if marriage is going to solve all our problems along the lines of lust and sexual desire and fulfillment, and these sorts of, of, of matters. And sex is a God-made reality pre-fall for God's glory. Song of Songs shows us that, that there's beauty in it. Of course, it's the way the human race perpetuates itself. There's a lot to say in this discussion. We said some things already earlier in the class. But suffice it to say that God, God wants us to inhabit the natural world, doesn't he? and not the unnatural world. You can put on a headset and enter virtual reality now, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty powerful as an experience. You can fire up your video games or, or on your computer, and you can have a very immersive experience for hour after hour. Uh, 
video gaming is such an engaging experience, and I used to play video games when I was younger, I know of what I speak, that young men in different countries wear diapers when they play video games so that they literally do not have to stop even to go to the bathroom. It's telling you something about how immersive technology is. What's, what is that saying? That's saying that the unnatural world has a major pull, doesn't it? It will draw you in as far as you are willing to go. And if we're handling technology uncritically, we can just promote it as good. It's good. We've got aspirin out of technology. We can make phone calls out of technology. We can teach the Bible on technology. On and on it goes. All that is true. It is also true that you can live in unreality and you can embrace the unnatural world. And when applied, let's say, for example, to marriage, what technology through pornography will allow you to do is slip into a frictionless world where there are no challenges, where you don't have to actually engage a living wife, where you don't have to live with her in an understanding way. You don't have to live with pornography in an understanding way, do you? Where, where you don't have to navigate the challenges of children and family and schedules and tiredness and changes to bodies post kids and all sorts of things and hardship and disease and struggle and lack of fulfillment and all the things that when you get into pastoral ministry, you're going to be appointed to deal with. Or you may be dealing with now to walk people through. Listen, marriage is a gift of God. There's tremendous good in it and blessing in it. And, and sex is incorporated into all of that. But no area of life is untouched by the fall, including this area, including marriage, and including even God-directed sex, God-glorifying covenantal union. But what you are doing, you may not even know it, what you are doing when you pursue unnatural sex is you're leaving all those challenges and difficulties behind. And those challenges and difficulties, they're not fun, but they are part of your sanctification. So what technology in different forms offer us is a frictionless existence, a frictionless life. You can go to war on your video game platform, but you don't bleed. You can pursue a woman and get her, and you don't have to understand her, and you don't have to lay down your life for her in an Ephesians 5 way. You can have experiences and travel the world, but you don't have to do any heavy lifting. You don't have to save your money. <laughs> we could play this out further. The point is plain. God hasn't made us to live in an unnatural world. God wants us in a stubbornly natural existence. It's not an easy existence. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to challenge us. It's supposed to be death to self. It's supposed to be tough. It's supposed to kill selfishness. Isn't it striking how, how much of the technology accessible to us enables us to be selfish when the entire gravity of the Christian faith is directly counter to selfishness? It is the mortification of selfishness. But there's addiction beyond sexual addiction. There's addiction to digital culture, a rising field of study in our time. It's remarkable that in a context that is featuring far too much addiction to technology, this pandemic and lockdown that has played out recently in our time has only made existence far more virtually connected. If you're paying attention to trends in the world, you could almost read that, you may well read that, 
as a form of judgment upon our society. That which is unhealthy for us, we are now getting more and more of. Here's what one researcher said about social media addiction. Technological addiction, yes? Not only did smartphone use and depression increase in tandem together, but time spent online, as this researcher studied these issues, was linked to mental health issues across two different data sets. We found that teens who spent five or more hours a day online were 71% more likely than those who spend only one hour a day to have at least one suicide risk factor. And those factors include depression, thinking about suicide, making a suicide plan, or attempting suicide. Overall, suicide risk factors rose significantly after two or more hours a day of time online. This is according to Gene Twenge in a Washington Post article based on a study published in Clinical Psychological Science in 2018, a, a medical journal. Overall, suicide risk factors rose significantly after two or more hours a day of time online. That data point should get our attention. This is not an, a, a far-flung discussion that we've worked into this class on issues in biblical anthropology. This is right here, right now. This is where people are. This is what pastoral care is going to look like increasingly. This is not the Puritans' generation. We have the Puritans' theology in many senses, and we need the Puritans' solutions to what ails us insofar as they drew on Scripture. But just note that this, is a, this really is a brave new world. The children in the congregations you lead as God blesses and allows are going to be facing a deluge, a flood of technological usage. Many schools now uh, in our time, in 2021, have done away with textbooks, for example, actual physical books at, in schools. Kids don't have a choice here. They're on iPads all the time. They're on computers all the time. Now again, a lot of us use computers a lot. I certainly do. I use technology a great deal. But my point is, you have to have a proper th theology of technology in order to use it well as a Christian, in order, in order to not be mastered by it, in order to not let it plunge you into sin and darkness and despair. Do not believe a theology of technology that simply reads it as neutral or positive in all respects. It can be neutral. It can be positive. It is in many respects. It also can destroy you. Scrolling on images. Studies show looking at lots of curated images of other people causes positive thinking, rightly correlated, understood, to plummet. There is an unnaturalness. Here, here, let's bring that concept back in. To the digital world that has sharp effects on many people. Some of you have, some of you have faced depressive thoughts. Some of you have probably contemplated dark things like suicide at different points because of technology. If you haven't, please know for certain that people in your church have. Please know for certain that youth you minister to have and will. These things are not far off from us. Probably you and I are more in that subset of humanity that still likes reading books a lot. <laughs> At least some of you. I, I, I'm very glad to be in the fellowship of theology nerds in that sense. But, but just know that if that's true of you, as I'm guessing it is for a good number of you, that a lot of people are leading digital lives. A, a lot of youth in particular are always on smartphones. Kids are getting smartphones 
before they're 10 years old. And almost nobody is thinking through these things. And very few churches are teaching on these things. And not just teaching in a broad sense. Very few pastors are offering wisdom and warning and guidance. I'm not talking about fundamentalistic legalism. I'm talking about pastors saying things like, you should be very careful knowing what we know about these kind of stats, about giving a child or even, I would say, a teen their own smartphone. I wouldn't do it, personally. And if I was a pastor, I wouldn't say this is the mark of being a Christian or not, so hear that. Hear me trying to be careful. But I would encourage parents not to give their children smartphones. I would encourage parents to strongly limit the amount of time on screens. I'm not talking about having to be on screens for school or something like this. That's almost a necessity for many children now, sadly. Sadly. I am saying beyond whatever you have to do, be careful. Encourage fathers and mothers to be very careful to limit screen time, to shove kids out the front door and say, go play. Play outside, even if there's just a small little area they have access to. Or if they, if they walk across the street to a park, walk with them as need be. And I would say furthermore to fathers and mothers and adults, you get off your phone. You get off your devices. Get exercise. Be outside as much as you can. It, it's challenging in some respects, I know, today. But get out as much as you can. Be off devices. Be off screens. Be in prayer. Be in meditation. Go for a walk and, and, and clear your mind. Get exercise. You're not a Gnostic being. Only this sort of consumptive brain in a vat drinking in technology at all times. God made, you, God made you an embodied soul. Treat yourself as if you are that. Bless yourself, in a sense, or, or, or better said, drink in God's blessing by being out in the world God has made. And again, off your phone. When you're talking with your spouse, don't be on your phone. When you're spending time with your kids, kick the phone across the room. Put it upstairs. Take action. I don't even know how this sounds to a seminary class. I don't know if this sounds like a weird tangent or like a sub-theological area. Uh, I don't know how it sounds. But this is the world we're in. And I don't know how, how many churches and ministry leaders are actually, they're using technology by the bushel, but I don't know how much they're discipling people who are in a technological age and are drinking technology by the gallon, in many cases unreflectively and un unspiritually, not approaching technology Spiritually, maybe you or professors or pastors you have had, maybe you, you, you think this is kind of like, uh, this is not really that spiritual. I think this, is, this, this isn't the way I, I set up the board. I, I, I don't, I want to be, I'm from Maine, man. I'm from Maine. A, a bunch of my family members still don't have smartphones. It's the green, the green texts, you know. When you text them, it's not the blue texting. You get what I'm saying? A bunch, of, a bunch of people I know back in New England still have rotary phones or, cor or corded phones. <laughs> That's the new rotary phone. I love getting out in nature. But I know that people are swimming in this, and I don't know that we're getting a lot of discipleship to handle this, this brave new world well. And I think, this is part of why preaching is not simply proclamation, right? It better be proclamation. It better be exposition. But it also needs to be application. And I'll put myself on record here. 
I think our application, yes, is going to dovetail with previous generations. So we're going to be giving application that Spurgeon would give, or Edwards would, would give, or Calvin would give. But we're also, I think, going to give specific application that they would not have given. I don't think you and I should simply assume that if we say, honor God with every minute you have in the day, if that's the, the major immediate theological takeaway of the text before us, which is a beautiful takeaway, I don't know that you should assume that everybody in your congregation is just magically going to apply that in a holistic, comprehensive way to their devices and their digital engagement. I think a lot of people are not. So I think these matters need to be thought about. Let me pause quickly and, sit and ask if there are any questions or even reflection at this point. There doesn't need to be. I have plenty more to cover, but Jared. Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, it's on my mind. A couple of days ago, I had a guy in discipling a ministry. Uh, he's 18, so he's not that much younger than me. Uh, but there's a clear, like, I don't know if generation is the right word, but there's a clear difference in between somebody my age and the amount of time uh, that they would be in with a screen and then him. And um, it actually caught my attention just as he was staying with me how much time he spent uh, on social media or whatever. And so I was, I mean, now that you're bringing this up, I'm thinking through, like, uh, what do you think are appropriate or wise ways to talk about that with somebody? And, like, what would, what would be the alternative if they're on social media two hours or five hours or whatever? What should I challenge them to do instead? Like, I guess you said prayer and all those things. Yeah, great question, Jared. I think I would say, oh man, <laughs> you guys can pick up probably that I'm a fairly bold individual and like, yeah, let's get into the trenches and figure it out. But here, here I really do feel when I try to start engaging this as if we really are facing a kind of 40 foot wave. And it's like we got a little kid's, you know, pink bucket. And, we're, and, and so the odds are the bucket against the wave here, especially with the younger generation. In discipleship, though, I do think we have plenty of resources. And I think what I'm going to try to communicate to this, this young man is he needs, to, he needs to lead a full life in the world that God has made. Um, he needs to be careful with social media. Um, we want to be feeding our soul we want to be serving our church. We want to be working our vocation. We want to be growing our mind, sharpening our mind. Um, we want to be getting exercise and caring for our body as the, the vessel that the spirit indwells. Um, we want to love our neighbor and share the gospel with our... We have a lot to do. And so I think, I, I think if you lay out for him even if it's not a direct assault on his technological investment. <laughs> you can do that too. But um, you also, you can do, you can challenge him, but you also can simply lay out. I think we need to lay out for people that the life dwindled on devices is not a fully God-centered life. I mean, you guys know what I mean. Look, we all spend time, I'm guessing, online and websites and, I don't know, sports or our interests or hobbies, but after a certain amount of engagement, it, it really dwindles in quality. And you're, you're just sort of, I think, I think I saw somebody call it the other day, doom scrolling. <laughs> you, you're sort of like, you're sort of half depressed, so you fire up Twitter and like, look at Twitter. What, what does that produce? <laughs> does that produce a veritable overflowing fountain of, of, you know, sort of overturned joy unto God? No! It produces, it produces just this malaise and ickiness, at least for me, when I'm on it too much. So I just, I, I want to be a voice to myself, because we all stumble in many ways, me included, of, again, you heard me say it, like viscerally, getting off devices. You know what I do increasingly? I just turn my phone off. Just turn it off. 
and then I go live life with my family. And you, you guys, some of you guys know this. Turning your phone off now feels like a radical act. Like, can I do that? Am I allowed to do that? But we need to take those kind of drastic actions, I think. It's not even that drastic. Maybe we shouldn't have a phone. I don't know. Maybe you should have a dumb phone. I'm, I'm open to different things. I have a smartphone, but if I'm going to have a smartphone, here's the deal, okay? I'm going to, I'm going to play defense and offense. Different people are in different places, right? I'm not setting up one policy and one policy alone here in what I'm saying, but I am, I am playing defense and offense, and part of how you do that is you embrace your God-given callings in life, and they do not involve you being perpetually distracted because you're scrolling stupidly on your social media. It involves a lot of the time, I think, at the very least, putting my phone aside and then having time to read, Jared, having time to pray, having time to go on a walk, having time to run, having time to lift weights, having time to serve the church in different ministries, uh, having time to read a deep theology book for an hour, not read, here again, not reading a book and checking Twitter every four and a half minutes, not reading a book and even tweeting a quote from the book or putting it on Instagram, just reading a book. Just read the book. Even that's a radical act now. Reading a book for an hour for some of us feels like an Olympic mental exercise. Why? Because frankly, guys, we're drenched in technology. It's too much. Most people are not in too little technology. A lot of us are in too much of it. And we need to, we need to take defensive and offensive steps away from it. So, sorry, I'm going on here, but the core of this is, 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 is reading scripture and praying, I believe. In your devotional time, put certainly then, at the least, put your phone away. By all means. We need more rigor, many of us. We're not talking about legalism. We're talking about grace-driven holiness. We need more rigor. We need more rules for ourselves. We do. It may not be rules that other people need to keep. We need rules for ourselves. I do. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop the, uh, the jag here. Uh, I'm going to go to Reed and then Steve and then Ben. Reed. Awesome. Well, first, I just want to say thanks for all that you said. I think it's just been helpful to think through. And I've honestly, uh, doing youth ministry, had more and more parents asking about technology um, and, and what to do with that. So you gave a lot to think about. Uh, with that, uh, the question I had, I've had some parents asking for resources um, on just technology and thinking through that. And from a, like a, a level of a parent, not necessarily on the theological level, but just one that a parent could read and digest and think. Do you have any resources that you would suggest um, just on everything we've been talking about? Yes. Um, Andy Crouch who I wouldn't agree with on every issue, might be a little different kind of footing in the kingdom, but um, he has written some good stuff on devices and parenting. I'm, I'm, <laughs> here I am on my smartphone, um, so that's great. Uh, I'm just looking up the title. My wife and I read some of this together. The TechWise Family, I'd commend that. Uh, I think that's a good book, helpful book. Not in a Christian sense, but... Um, Cal Newport, some of you have heard this name. I think I commended deep, the book Deep Work to you the other day. Uh, Cal Newport has written a book called Digital Minimalism that is excellent. It's not going to be a deep dive into theology, obviously, but it is really good in terms of practices. And I would also say deep work here again because so much of what we're, we're talking about as a problem here is shallowness, okay? Even a, a bigger issue, I think we could say, than technology, the zoomed out issue before us, 
that we're grappling with and facing is shallowness. Living an, an entertained, like the postman quote at the beginning of class, of, at the beginning of this section, living an entertained, shallow, surfing little life. And so, Newport's book on deep work calls for us not to do shallow work. It's in the, it's in the area of work. So he's saying, don't, don't multitask, basically. Stop multitasking. Everybody prides themselves on multitasking. He's basically the anti-multitasker. He's saying, do one task. And not just for 11 minutes and then pat yourself on the back. Do one task for three hours. Newport's argument is that our attention is our most valuable commodity. Here again, not a Christian, but this, this would be a contact point, I think, honestly, with what the Bible teaches. It, you can find this biblically if you go looking for it. Our attention is really our most valuable commodity. What does God want? What is God after? What does worship involve? It's not shallow. It's not distracted. It's not half-hearted. It's our attention. It's our attention. But what do, what do so much of our technological programs and systems, devices do? Divide our attention, split it, carve it up into little bitty pieces. So from different angles, Newport's work will help us, I think, um, recover a proper Christian, because we'll, we'll, we'll bring theology. We'll, we'll, see this, we'll see this not as an insight of a Georgetown University professor who wrote these books. It'll actually drive us to see, oh wait, the Bible is making the case that I should pay attention to God. What, what is the Shema? You, you can get, this gets theological in about 0.1 seconds. What is the Shema? Hear, O Israel. What, what is Israel's problem so frequently in the Old Testament? What are they not doing? Paying attention. What is our problem so frequently as Christians? It's not most of us that we've like got carving knives and we're about to go hunt somebody down and kill them in cold blood. Occasionally a problem maybe. A much more common problem for most of us would simply be paying attention. So, those are some, those are some quick thoughts. Uh, Tony Reinke of Desiring God has written a book, I believe it's called 12 Ways Your Smartphone is Changing You, or iPhone is Changing You, something like that. Tony Reinke, R-E-I-N-K-E, I'm sure you've heard that, but he, that's a strong book too. So, anyway, good Good question and good thoughts. Thank you. Ben. Yeah, I had a question about pastoring and social media, um, the influence the pastor has on social media in terms of shepherding the church at large and then the local church. Um, do you think that social media is helpful in shepherding your local flock, or does it um, hurt relationships? terms of feeling like you're engaging with them, but you're really not? And then also, does it hurt the church at large in terms of unity? And uh, what are your thoughts of social media as a good pastor? I think that social media is kind of a uh, digital version of life. So insofar as we, as Christian ministers, seek to proclaim and contend for the faith in real life, human interaction. So I think we can use social media to do that. So that's my take. I don't, I, I'm not one who says pastors don't be on social media as some kind of edict. But for some of the reasons you mentioned in your, in your perceptive question, I would urge pastors especially to be careful on social media and to model James 1, excuse me, 19 to 20, to model being slow to speak, being slow to anger, being quick to listen, and 
I would want pastors to understand that they really need to bring the fruits of the Spirit to bear in that con- context, excuse me, let's say of Twitter, where the fruits of the Spirit are not always <laughs> carrying the day, shall we say. But I, I think Christians have an opportunity on social media, as frankly in tons of places in life, to stand out, to be distinct, to be a witness. So I'm glad for Christians to be on social media. I'm on social media, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, but I I have to bring my Christianity with me to social media. And I need to pray hard to be a leader on social media And I think for most pastors, that is going to mean not a lot of social media engagement, frankly. So pastors who say, you know, I think I'm going to be on it. Okay, I'm I'm personally fine with that. I mean, I'm even good with that in terms of having men who promote sound doctrine on these different platforms. Good. But do so carefully, do so humbly, and do so sparingly. That's what I would say. A pastor who's on, and you see this, I see this, (laughs) you see this. You see pastors who are tweeting 25 times a day, 15 times a day, and you're just like, what are you doing? (laughs) Do you you have a fair amount, I I know your church, (laughs) you have a fair amount to do. So those are some of the things I would say. No Christian should let social media, I think, dominate their existence. Some, some believers may work for companies as, you know, social media coordinator or whatever. So, so we have some play here, but we should not let social media dominate our existence. We should, in, we should approach it carefully, circumspectly, humbly, and I think as much as is possible, sparingly. People in our churches are going to have tech jobs, so let that be said. But even those people were trying to train in those rhythms. I don't think this is going to get easier, by the way. I think this is going to get harder. I think think you guys, you guys are the next generation, by and large. Like, I think you guys need to get equipped on this. And I think you guys need to enter your, your pastorate, if you haven't already, with a developed theology of technology. And I think you need to be ready to do Sunday school uh, classes or equipping sessions on Friday night or, or, or um, three-part series in the fall or sermon series. I think you need to be ready to, to really dig into this with people. And I do not think you should give once every six months a stray remark you know, kind of a quick aside, brush off of Facebook or something. I mean, I get it. These platforms, frankly, are kind of silly. Twitter's kind of silly. Facebook is kind of silly. Instagram, et cetera. But people are on them. So more than just brushing it off, as if that makes it go away, you need to shape people's engagement of it. Do a six-part series on technology, a sermon series. Do a three-part series. Do a 10-part equipping class, whatever your church has, on technology. And it's not, it's not you know, just your stray thoughts. It's a, it's, it's a biblical engagement of it. Think it through. Any, uh, uh, Steve, did you have your vir- virtual hand up a minute ago? something and they haven't been taught how to 
go off the rails. I was wondering, maybe generally, if you had any wisdom to shed on, on that problem. I think you're right, Steve. I think you cannot put the water back in the dam once it breaks. So you're, you're picking up rightly that thread that I was just giving. I'm holding back water, not because it's all evil, not because I, I think my, my kids, my three children, won't use technology. I think they will. They, they are now in different forms. They do watch shows on the iPad, you know. We do watch TV. They use the computer in certain forms very, very carefully, and the computer is right in the middle of the house for us. Um, but I'm not raising ah technological children. But I am holding back a lot. And that's part of what a dad does, by the way. Father does. I'm not setting this up as if the woman, the wife, just is always saying yes. I don't mean that. But part of what we do as fathers, for example, is, is we say no. <laughs> we, are a, we are a sturdy demonstration uh, of, hopefully, godly, loving authority. And part of that, in, in a world that has fallen, is saying no. And, and not doing certain things and holding things back as much as we can. Now, don't misunderstand. This isn't a legalistic understanding of fatherhood or, or parenting where the parenting task is reduced to no and not being cultural in any form. That's, that's not where I am. I think I made that clear. But there are a lot of things to say no to. So there, there is a no in the Strand home unapologetic and unqualified to, to smartphones being possessed by any of the Strand children until they are in college. That's, that's my current framing of the policy. I see no reason why it will change. And so if I'm a pastor, if I'm an elder, I'm just conveying that. I, I'm giving reasons why. I'm, I'm making the case. But I want to embrace technology increasingly only with great care. Because it does have that tendency, it's hard to pin down why, but it has that tendency once it's in to reshape, to take over its environment. It's hard to be, it's hard to be uh, balanced with technology. It's hard to play video games for 36 minutes a day. It's kind of like preaching long versus preaching short. <laughs> it's easy to preach long, isn't it? As you get older? Oh, I didn't have time to cut that sermon down. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to engage technology short. It's hard to play video games for 13 and a half minutes. It's hard to watch basketball for, for 17 minutes. It's easy to watch it for three hours. Why? Why, Strand? I have no idea. <laughs> it's the nature of the beast. So I think we approach these things as fathers and mothers from a posture of carefulness. And that means that we're weird to a serious degree in our community, and then also to some degree for, for a lot of us, even in our church. We're weird. Not just as fathers and mothers, we ourselves are weird. Some of us already pre-qualify for that. But the way we structure our life is intentionally spiritual. It is intentionally God-centered. It is intentionally biblical, as much as we can get it there. Well, congratulations. Welcome to the world of weirdness. It's not having kids over and watching movies at the Strand House, you know, cultural movies. It, uh, we're not. We're we're going to be very careful about that. My kids do watch movies, to be clear, uh, occasionally. But we're not. My my. What I mean is, we're not going to just. We're not just going to bring friends over and entertain them, with whatever the culture is watching, and likes. We're going to stand out here. It's going to be hard. We're going to make hard choices. We're going to try to protect our kids as much as we can. We can't make them Christians. We can't unfallenize the world as a father and mother. Bethany and I cannot do that. But we're going to work very hard to protect. I am the protector of my wife, and I am the protector of my three children. And I take that deadly seriously. 
And I take it seriously not just in the physical sense, I take it seriously in all senses, including the digital sense. There's a lot more to flesh out, no pun intended, but uh, that's at least a quick word. All right, home stretch. Here we go. Let's talk about technology in the Bible. The Bible begins with the doctrine of creation. So the doctrine of creation is not purely technological, I suppose, but note where we are already in what I just said. <clears throat> what does God do? How does the Bible introduce us to God? It doesn't introduce God with a lengthy section on his attributes. It doesn't give us an encyclopedia article on the inner workings of the Godhead. The Bible begins with the doctrine of divine creation. The Bible begins with an acting God, a God who is doing dynamic work. And what does he do specifically? He creates a world that is teeming with life. God creates, as many of you have heard, ex nihilo from the Latin, from nothing. That tells us something about the, the nature and character of God. He loves life. He wanted there to be a world, a world that would be intimately bound up with him, not such that it is part of him or he is part of it, of course, not that he is dependent on it in any way. He is perfectly free. And yet, he decided that he would put his glory on display. The Father planned all these things, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, as I'm going to be talking about to the CSUN student ministry this afternoon, this evening that is, at about 7 I think, and we're preaching this. The Father decided that the world would exist in order that there would be a people for Himself saved by the blood of His Son through faith in the name of the Son. God decided that. We're not dealing, therefore, in biblical terms with an abstract God who fundamentally doesn't really care whether there is a world that exists. God decided there would be a world. He created the world out of his magnificent, infinite freedom in order to put his glory on display. I am Edwardsian in that sense, in many senses, including that one. That the reason all things exist, the purpose, the end for which God created the world was the display of his own glory. Therefore, the reason we, who follow God by his grace, do anything is not first and foremost to get people saved or to grow a church numerically or something like that. The reason we do anything is for the glory of God. That's the first reason we do things. Rick Holland, uh, my pastor in Kansas City, preached a great sermon on being a father and a mother, and that was his first point in being a father and mother. It's not actually to get your children saved. It's not to make them a Christian. It's not, it's not first and foremost, that they would be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first end in being a father and mother in parenting is to glorify God. The first end in being a pastor is not to grow a church. It's to glorify God. The first end in being an individual Christian, as you surely are, is to glorify God. That's the ultimate end of all things. That's why God created. And what God creates on the sixth day is the human person, as we have talked about, and the human body is truly a wonder, if you want to use this term, of technology, isn't it? The body of mankind is not really just one supercomputer. It's many supercomputers working together, often seamlessly, not always, of course, in a fallen world, tragically, in order to flourish, in order for the human person to exist. The body is truly a marvel, a feat of making, of creation. Here is what Michael Behe has said, for example, about how we see. The biochemistry of vision, he calls it. <laughs> when light first strikes the retina, a photon interacts with a molecule called 11 cis retinal, which rearranges within picoseconds to transretinal. The change in the shape of retinal forces a change in the shape of the protein rhodopsin to which the retinal is tightly bound. He continues a little bit further. When attached to activated rhodopsin and its entourage, the phosphodiesterase acquires the ability to chemically cut a molecule 
called CGMP. Another membrane protein that binds CGMP is called an ion channel. When the amount of CGMP is reduced because of cleavage by the phosphodiesterase, the ion channel closes, causing the cellular concentration of positively charged sodium ions to be reduced. I know you were just thinking that to yourself. Of course that's what happens. This causes an imbalance of charge across the cell membrane, which finally causes a current to be transmitted down the optic nerve to the brain. The result, when interpreted by the brain, is vision. And that was a greatly reduced summary, which I read to you, of how we see. You seeing me right now on your screen involved all of that. Light first striking your retina and then a photon interacting with 11 cis retinal. And then there were 13 other steps to follow. What's, what's the point? The point is that something so simple as seeing my face on your screen, poor you, involves extreme complexity. Extreme complexity. And God hardwired all of this. I read that because we take for granted so much that God has done. We, we are such uninterested creatures, really and ungrateful creatures, frankly, in our natural state. And yet look at what has to happen in order for us simply to see an image. All of that. How does God design the human body? Well, he designs man and woman so that they can come together in sexual union, procreate, and then the woman, and the woman alone, of course, can nurture and then bear a child in her womb. That's not technically technology, I suppose. But nonetheless, do not miss the wonder of, of human procreation. N no one activates that process in terms of like the formation of the child. I mean, you don't have a prompt, right, that comes up and you choose uh, when this body part is going to be developed in the, ba by, in the baby's body in the womb. No one makes those decisions. God hardwires the body so that all this happens. Well, this is giving us something of a theology of, of these matters, isn't it? It's telling us something about creation, the human person, and if you're being careful in your terms, technology. In Genesis 11, we see mankind tragically not using the human body for good, but actually working in technological avenues for the glorification of man. Genesis 11.1, 1, the whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make oven-fired bricks. And by the way, parenthesis, that means that they use brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered throughout the earth. Here's what John Walton says in his commentary about this passage. Mud brick is not durable, so it was a great technological development to discover that baking the brick made it as durable as stone. This was still an expensive process since the kilns had to be fueled. As a result, mud brick was used as much as possible, with baked brick used only for outer shells of important buildings or where waterproofing was desirable. You and I read Genesis 11 and we think, what an ancient world, making oven-fired bricks as this major technological feat. That actually was a very expensive and intricate technological process. If you pay attention in Scripture, there's, there's a lot of technology beneath the surface, including in Genesis 11. Of course, we know, sadly, that what is not transpiring here is the worship of the living God, thankfulness to God. In fact, this tower in Babel is being built to blaspheme God by exalting human ingenuity, human making. The people wanted, as I read, a name for themselves, they, and they were using scientific and technological means to get there. They were sinning against God. 
through this technological advancement. So there, technology facilitated evil. The Bible's telling you something. This is a multifaceted chapter and event, but one thing we are learning if we are paying attention is that technology can easily facilitate evil in a fallen world. Now, interestingly, going back for just a minute, the call to take dominion would tell us that it's not, it cannot necessarily be wrong to bring technological means to steward God's creation. It can't be wrong. What, are, what, what was Adam supposed to do? Take dominion of the earth and subdue the earth. Well, that's going to involve all sorts of human creativity, isn't it? In, back in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. So if we're working carefully here, building text upon text unto systematic theology, then we need to understand that the Scripture in the pre-fall world has not said that taking dominion of the world is an evil thing. It's a good thing to take dominion of the world, which is going to involve processes of ingenuity, creativity, and technology. But those same abilities and proclivities can easily go wrong in a post-Genesis 3 world as they do in Babel. What did the people want to build? They wanted to build a city and a tower. The tower was to be a beacon of humanly transcendence. Instead of a majestic structure that pointed to heaven to lift people to heaven, it seems clear that this structure was pointed downward, not at the greatness of God, but at the greatness of man. And that still takes place in our world. Think of skyscrapers, but not just physical structures, of course, but skyscrapers are one example. Well, cathedrals point us to God, or at least supposed to in different forms. Some skyscrapers are supposed to be a monument not to what is above, to what is below, to mankind. Babel, then, is an early shot across the bow in the biblical storyline that warns us to be very careful of our capacities for creation, for creativity. Steward this carefully is one lesson God is saying to us. Do not use technology for pride, prideful means to make yourself great. A temptation that is not only found in physical building of structures, but is found in all dimensions of life. I mean, we think about how we all have to steward ambition, for example. We have to steward spiritual ambition and not fall into selfish ambition. That's not an easy reality to, to adjudicate in certain cases. We need to be careful, even today, in those regards. But of course, that's not the only picture of craftsmanship and making that we have. In Exodus 31, moving ahead in the biblical narrative, the Lord specially indicates His blessing on Bezalel, the craftsman. Exodus 31, verse 3. We learn that Bezalel is filled with God's Spirit, with wisdom, understanding, and ability in every craft to design artistic works in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut gemstones for mounting, and to carve wood for work in every craft. Here is clearly God blessing, no less than sending His Spirit, not upon a king, not upon a judge or a priest. On who? A craftsman. A physical worker. Designing the tabernacle, building it, the physical structure of it. The Spirit came upon Bezalel in order that he would build something beautiful to God. Design artistic works, the Bible says. The Bible is not down on art. The Bible is not down on beauty. The Bible is not down on craftsmanship and creativity. The Bible is not down on 
vocations that are, that are non-ministerial. The Spirit came upon Bezalel so that he would carve wood for work. Isn't that beautiful? You understand how significant that is? For our understanding, I'm, I'm getting into tomorrow's lesson, but <laughs> our understanding of vocation? Look, we have a high calling. I think the highest calling in Christian ministry, not, not proudly, but for God's glory. Nonetheless, do not miss that God highly esteems other vocations outside of the priesthood in the Old Testament context, for example. God blessed Bezalel in order to be seriously creative and to work really hard and for a long time to do things like cut gemstones. Well, I think if you frame this rightly, package it accurately, you're, you're recognizing that essentially, boiling it down, God blesses Bezalel's technological craftsmanship to make something that didn't exist for the worship of the living God. So too with Oholiab and the faithful designers who labor on the tabernacle. They create an ark, a pure gold lampstand, multiple altars, specially woven garments, on and on it goes. They create a ton of things. Look, it, it, it takes technology to make a pure gold lampstand. You have to do a number of processes. You don't just, you know, go into the Old Testament Hobby Lobby and come out with a pure gold lampstand. Somebody has to build that. Somebody has to make that. Now, interestingly, one chapter over from this clearly divinely blessed craftsmanship and vocation that involves numerous technological processes, what does Aaron do? In Exodus 32, Aaron forms an idol, a golden calf. How did Aaron do it? The details of the Bible are so compelling, aren't they? When you actually look for them. You're at a school that encourages you to look for them exegetically, expositionally, praise God, as does mine. Kostenberger's at my school, others of that nature, DeRoshi. Some of you may come to Midwestern to do a PhD even along those lines. Well, look at Exodus 32, 4. What is Aaron, how does Aaron form the idol? Through an engraving tool. Do you think you go to a tree and pluck an engraving tool off of it? No! Somebody has to make that. How do you make it? Technologically, man. And then what do you do with it? Aaron makes a golden calf. He doesn't go into the storehouse facility and come out with the golden calf. He makes it. He engraves it. He shapes it. He forms it. Wow! That's really interesting. We've got, within the span of two chapters, godly, holy craftsmanship and blasphemous, idolatrous craftsmanship. You see the contrast? I wonder, you know, honestly, if we're supposed to pick that up as we're paying attention, paying attention to the Bible. The construction of the, the, construction of the golden calf is the mirror opposite of the construction of the tabernacle. Both involve craftsmanship. The construction of the tabernacle, going back just a quick minute, required spinners, weavers, tailors, dyers, metallurgi metallurgists, workers with iron, silversmiths, woodworkers, lapidaries, perfumers, tanners. It's a lot of technology there. Sadly, the formation of the golden calf probably brought into play a lot of those same skills and workers. <laughs> you understand? So one, one group is led by Bezalel and others into godly use of human creative abilities, and another group is led to use their capacities to blaspheme God. If we're paying attention... I think Scripture is giving us a theology of technology, a complex one. 
What about the New Testament? The greatest anthropological miracle that has ever happened in human history is the coming of Christ to earth as a man to die for our sins. Isn't that interesting? As gifted as humankind is, the greatest miracle that happens does not happen because of anything man does or plans, but happens because of the initiation of Almighty God. In a world that obsesses over and idolizes technology, the greatest thing that has happened is nothing no human mind has ever done or called for. It is only that which God has done, this divine intrusion through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. There's a rebuke there, if you're paying attention, to a man-centered anthropology. Jesus is the true miracle, not any device, not any platform, and Jesus is that which should draw our interest more than anything else. Interestingly, Jesus was a carpenter, as you will know. Jesus worked a technological trade in a rudimentary form, didn't he? Jesus built structures with his hands. Jesus created something physically that did not exist. Even as God, the Father, has executed creation through the Son, the Spirit hovering over the waters in Genesis 1, correlating that with John 1, even as God has built the world, what does Jesus do in His earthly vocation? He builds structures. When He enters His earthly ministry, Jesus the carpenter made frequent references to the material world much of it existing due to human technology. We probably miss these, at least from this technological angle, but Jesus spoke of several things, for example, cities and lamps, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. He spoke of houses built on different foundations. Jesus built houses. He's a carpenter. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. He spoke of city gates, Matthew 7, 13 to 14. He referenced fishing nets, Matthew 13, 47 to 50. Oil lamps, Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Investing money, activity dependent on market exchange, Matthew 25, 14 to 30. There's a little bit more here than we thought, wasn't there? In terms of technology, this is, this is compelling. Everything I just mentioned involves building and creativity and craftsmanship and making and in different forms, the use of technology. Many of Jesus' teachings are situated, therefore, in engagement with the technology of his day. He's not teaching some sort of non-contextual doctrine, is he? No, he's actually referencing frequently the material culture and built environment of his world. Don't take my word for granted. Study it. Search it out. Cities, lamps, houses, fishing nets, oil lamps, gates. That's just a sampling. I'm sure there's more. Interestingly, the Lord's Supper depends upon technological processes. Matthew 26, 26 and following. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I would guess that a lot of Christians have never thought of the Lord's Supper in association with 
technological craftsmanship. But think about this. A meal that memorializes the very epicenter of our salvation, the accomplishment of our redemption, depends on bread making and grape pressing. The formation of bread and the making of wine. In order to celebrate the atoning work of Jesus following his death, the church needed access to those who could harvest wheat, mill it, create the right dough mixture, and bake it. In order to take the cup, someone had to grow grapes, which is no easy thing, harvest them, crush them, and ferment them. Guys, we don't pay attention to the Word of God. We don't think these things through when we read these things, especially if we've been in the church for a long time. You don't just get bread and wine. You don't go out and it's, it's there on a table, right? Technology has to be engaged at a very ingenious level in order to get the Lord's Supper. No, I'm not trying to overdo this. I'm not trying to make the Bible a technology textbook or something. But I, I am trying to think about even the subterranean level of our faith and see that there's actually a lot here to think through with regard to pulling together a whole Bible doctrine of technology. I don't think this whole Bible doctrine reduces neatly to only one reality, but I do think there's a lot here. Think about, think about the transmission of Scripture. We tend to think of the first century world as a kind of ancient world, almost prehistoric, yes? The inscripturation of the Bible transpired through a technical process, a very material process. The Holy Spirit, of course, speaks through the human authors, and to record divine revelation, the biblical author takes a stylus or a quill, which doesn't grow on trees, it has to be fashioned, and then takes parchment, which again doesn't fall out of the air, has to be formed, and then the original manuscripts are transcribed, and then they're copied and passed on. Eventually, centuries later, they'll be bound. And more centuries after that, in the 15th century, poor Gutenberg will go into debt that he never recovers from, even into the 16th century, and will print the works of Luther and others. Now we're extra-biblical, of course, just to make that plain. Suffice it to say that the Christian faith advances massively, how? Technology. Even go back for a minute. The early church takes the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the other ends of the earth, right? What does that involve? How did they do that? Did they just walk wherever they wanted to go? Frequently they traveled on what? Roman roads. And in terms of the sea, Roman ships. Do those emerge from the skies fully formed? No. No, they don't. A proper theology of technology as we wrap up today neither unreservedly cheers it nor unequivocally denounces it, as I seek to be faithful to these different biblical realities, these details, really, in a lot of cases, that actually, I think, speak more loudly than we might think they do. It should definitely be the case, instead, that we exercise real scrutiny when it comes to technological claims 
at the worldview level and that we exercise scrutiny when it comes to the actual processes we undergo. The Bible, said more simply, is teaching us that there are limits in what we should do in terms of technology. We talked about that most significantly, of course, with Babel. Do not assume, because human beings are doing it and building it, that it is good and God-honoring. Do not assume, because it engages human creativity and ingenuity, that it honors God. Would be one major takeaway of a biblical theology of technology. Do not assume that. In fact, what is being developed along these lines may be intentionally designed to blaspheme God. Well, we need to think that through. On the other hand, do not dismiss technology. You wouldn't have the Lord's Supper without technological processes, to cite just one example. So I think we can recognize that there is a proper stewardship of technology that we need to make disciples better understand by divine grace. We need to communicate that we're going to avail ourselves of technology in all sorts of ways. As human beings, men and women, in this world, in the God-made world, what did God do when He wanted to put His glory on display? Going back to the very beginning of this little unit, He made a world. He embodied humanity. We don't need to pretend that we are disembodied beings, for we are not. But what does, the, what does the end vision of the new Jerusalem look like in Revelation 21? We'll close with this for today. Revelation 21, 19. The foundations of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation, jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedon. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amacinth. The twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. The broad street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. What's the point? The point is that at the end of all things, in the eternal state, this city is gloriously beautiful that the same God who made the world, who created the world, has now created a new world where we dwell together with God in perfect love and in perfect harmony. In fact, He has remade the world to undo the curse and to truly beautify it. God then is the original creator and God is the recreator. Theologically, that's a key part of what we understand biblically of God. All of this tells us then that we are in no position to despise technology, to dismiss it, but we must steward it carefully. We must seek, as we talked about some in the Q&A in particular, to honor God through technological means. We do not want to participate in the usage of technology that blasphemes God and dishonors Him. And it is not hard at all for that to happen. And we must recognize that many around us today are not just engaging technology too much, that's a real problem, but they are in fact, as we talked about with transhumanism and posthumanism, believing in a secular or neo-pagan technological vision that is directly opposed to God. And to all of these problems and challenges and opportunities, we bring the gospel and the whole counsel of God. And you and I need to seek increasingly to make disciples who engage technology well, who are not mastered by it, but who use it for the enjoyment of life to God's glory 
and even for the promotion of the greatness of God Himself. Just as those roads and those ships and that bread and that wine were used by the church 2,000 years ago for just that purpose.